So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Kimaya and Siddharth for that nice introduction. You have been able to pick up some stuff from somewhere <laughs> and be able to read out. As I always tell people, you know, when you look at the sky in the night, you you tend to attribute in some way or the other to this world. Okay. As long as you do that with a lot of passion uh, and a lot of commitment, there will be something good that's going to come out of it. And that's the story that I'm going to tell you. Uh, as so many great people have been behind uh, the so-called uh, this gambit of probing at the small scale. I'm going to talk about the story of some of them as I go along and how exciting the world is. Uh, when you try to go deeper into your materials. I am known to be the so-called physical metallurgist, okay? And the physical metallurgist's job is to design materials. And if you want to design a new material, it is important that you understand the materials. When you understand the materials, you can wonderfully design new materials with new properties and for a specific applications and be able to create uh, materials are specific tailored properties okay so that's the beauty of physical metallurgists and uh, i belong to that particular group and where all my life i can say i've been a microscopist uh, about 30 years now uh, and uh, and microscopy something has become part of my life and and variety of microscopes i have uh, dealt with in my life and this is one such thing which I thought is going to be uh, exciting to all of you and uh, uh, would possibly make some of you uh, think of working in such a field where I started my life uh, with that particular instrument about 20 years back. So let me uh, go and try to you what is exciting about the whole thing. As, as a, as a uh, person in general, you know, everyone, now uh, wants to know uh, anything in depth. And when you know uh, the, the undergoing principles and uh, underlying principles of anything, uh, there's always an excitement. There is always a sad having learned something. You know, I remember as a B.Tech student of your age, I, uh, without boasting, I can tell you, I, I have read almost every book that was in the library at VRC. The only reason was I want, was very clear that I would become a teacher one day. In fact, the one who uh, was responsible for me to choose teaching as a profession passed away just yesterday. One professor, A.V. Ramarao, the one who taught me physical metallurgy at R.E.C. Nagpur and the one uh, who inspired me so much to an extent that I asked him at the end of my B.Tech, sir, what should I do if I have to become a teacher like you? And he said, Murthy, you should do a PhD and there is no place better than IAC Bangalore. And that's how I ended up in IAC Bangalore and continued my life. Uh, so, so such a person who, to whom I dedicated my PhD thesis, uh, when I was doing that at IAC Bangalore, nobody actually knew who this Professor Ramara was. And, uh, and I had to tell my guide, Professor Ranganathan, uh, how he inspired me to actually even come to a place called IAC. So, so there are always people who who inspire you through uh, their uh, you know in-depth knowledge, and it is important when you try to go deeper and understand, then you will be able to uh, do something to this world, contribute something to this world. Many a times when uh, when you try to you know any one of you, if you had an experience trying to teach some small concept to somebody. Uh, you would understand how much you know about that concept and how much you do not know about the concept when you try to teach someone. Writing an exam is entirely different from trying to teach someone. Uh, so that is when you went inside your conscience tells you, oh, today I did not teach well this particular concept. You might somehow manage that class, uh, but you would know it to yourself that you oh, did not do well. So I didn't want to become somebody of that nature. So whenever there was something that I did not understand. I used to go from one book to the other book and so on until I get an answer for that. Until then, I, I never was satisfied. I was even spending late nights 
to understand those concepts so that is what i am trying to tell you so what it means by going deeper as people say you dive deep into an ocean you will see the pearls and that's exactly what is an excitement that one can feel when he dives deep into materials and let's see how this journey of people who wanted to dive deep into materials uh, has taken a shape to an extent where now we are able to understand materials much better than what people knew much earlier you know people started with this kind of things people knew about snowflakes as old as kepler uh, and people also knew about these sodium chloride crystals and when people saw this they saw there must be something uh, which which inherent inside the material which is making them take those shapes for example the six fold symmetry that you see in snowflakes and the kind of a four fold symmetry that you see in these cubes of sodium chloride crystals should tell you that possibly there is something inside and that's the reason why people thought that external morphology has something to do with the internal structure internal arrangement of atoms though people did not know people had to wait almost up to the uh, uh, you know x ray diffraction being invented by people uh, until they come to know what it means by structure until then people only thought there is something inside which is reflecting the outside shape but they were not able to talk much about it and at some stage people once they started knowing that there is something called structure inside a material they started classifying materials into two groups they called it as crystalline materials and amorphous materials and crystalline materials are those if you all are at least in the third year or second year metallurgy and so on you would have come across a powder diffraction pattern something of this nature which gives you peaks and the moment you see uh, peaks like this sharp peaks you will say oh this is a crystalline material the moment you see a broad peak like what you have on the left top corner you would say oh this is an amorphous material and the same material if you put it inside a electron microscope and do a, a, in a tem and get a diffraction pattern you would get a spotty pattern as you see on the right uh, bottom a ring pattern a diffuse ring pattern as you see on the left bottom and which indicate they are crystalline and amorphous and this crystalline material particularly if you carefully observe this spotty pattern you would notice that the distance between all the spots are periodically arranged and we said uh, crystalline materials are those which are periodic in nature and they have also certain symmetry inside them which are people define them as typical rotational symmetries in a point group symmetry and people thought that there are uh, no materials which are beyond this until somebody came up uh, and started talking about something which is entirely different from what people knew and that is what people call them as quasi crystals if you look at the three images at the bottom the central one is a diffraction pattern the two on the right side the right and left side are are the crystals which are grains inside a material which have wonderful five fold symmetry this five fold symmetry is not something new people knew this in nature a lot of flowers have five petals and you have those star fish which are also very exciting and they have five fold symmetry and five fold symmetry in a in a material in a metallic material uh, was seen for the first time in 1982 by a great gentleman when he looked at this particular diffraction pattern coming out of an aluminum alloy he was working with a, a great gentleman by name john con okay john con was uh, one of the greatest physical metallurgists in the world and he wanted dan shetman uh, who was a post doc with him uh, to uh, 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 aluminum alloys which are rapidly solidified aluminum alloys uh, which are their interest is to make uh, high strength lightweight materials in that direction he gave uh, he asked uh, this gentleman to work on such materials and he made an alloy which is aluminum manganese alloy with 14% manganese and when when he was looking at the microstructure of this alloy he saw some precipitates which are there on the right uh, bottom corner and he put the electron beam on that the man sitting there uh, in front of the uh, you know tem i can just tell you a small story of me meeting him 2011 he got the nobel prize that was in august i went to iowa state university where he was a professor in the month of june july hmm, the same year 
and having worked on quasi crystals partially during my phd and a little later i was always curious to meet dan shetman because everybody who worked on quasi crystal for them dan shetman is like a god huh? who made that particular field so famous and so the moment i went to iowa state university with uh, i have a friend there by name you know um, uh just not getting right now okay so so uh, martin, martin kramer his name okay so so i asked him matt uh, can can i have a chat with uh, dan sometime he said yes uh, i will find out his convenience and take you there sometime and we were talking about him and a man uh, who was about 60 years old enters into that room and he said uh, matt i'm just planning to do a tm today morning Uh, is the tm free uh, can you please let me know so matt was in charge of the tm and this gentleman tells me murthy the person whom you are looking for is this gentleman he was around 60 65 age uh, at that particular point of time and at that age he sits in front of the microscope and looks at materials the exciting uh, behavior of materials at their small scale and within one month after that we came to know that he got the nobel prize and the only reason is he was able to shake the belief of people that there are materials which have symmetries other than what people thought as forbidden symmetries okay people thought there are only certain symmetries that are possible in material and anything beyond that people thought they are all forbidden symmetries for example uh, what is called a five fold symmetry if you carefully look at this diffraction pattern you will see uh, five spots there which is a pentagon uh, kind of and you see ten spots around the transmitted beam there okay so this is something which nobody has seen until 1982 you can see his log book which is april 8 1982 and he puts a question mark there uh, tenfold uh, and he went to the extent uh, to tell everybody about it and but nobody believed him nobody believed him to the extent that john con had to tell him please leave my group you are bringing disgrace to my group talking about something called quasi crystals which does not exist and everybody is against you and because of you i am getting a bad name and then he uh, uh, is one guy who doesn't accept uh, you know failures easily and once he believed in something he went on to uh, prove that such things do exist so he talked to uh, two mathematicians bletch and gratias uh, in this particular paper his first paper which was sent in 1982 was rejected okay and then he worked with two people who are mathematicians who tried to show that if there is not periodicity inside the atomic arrangement if there can be a quasi periodic arrangement inside the atoms okay uh, i mean inside the material uh, among the atoms uh, something like a fibonacci sequence you all know how a fibonacci sequence looks like if such an arrangement of atoms are there then a diffraction pattern taken from such a thing can show you a five fold symmetry and with that proof they were able to get this paper published in 1984 almost two years after he actually saw the whole thing and that tells you how uh, you know uh, important to have commitment and belief in yourself okay uh, to the extent that people have changed the way people define crystal until then uh, international union of crystallography used to define a uh, crystal is something which is periodic full stop okay and in 1991 they have changed the definition of a crystal and now crystal is defined as a solid uh, which has a discrete diffraction pattern that's it okay and the moment it has a discrete diffraction pattern there is an order inside the material okay so that's what professor ranganathan my supervisor said the divorce between the order and periodicity, uh, periodicity is the beauty of shetman's discovery okay he was able to define that a material can be ordered at the same time it need not be periodic okay that periodicity need not go along with an order all the time it is something a beautiful discovery that came in 1982 all this is because he tried to probe deep into that particular material and i should also tell you here that how important it is to believe in yourself okay in 1978 almost 6 uh, years before dan shetman's paper got published our people from india professor shastri and professor surnarna together with uh, uh, two foreigners uh, looked at an alloy called aluminum palladium alloy and exactly saw a similar five fold diffraction pattern you can see the pentagon here okay and 
and unfortunately they did not pursue this uh, seriously because their own supervisor did not believe in this okay uh, so this is something in a typical indian system that uh, when your guide does not uh, you know appreciate what you do you tend to drop it off rather than you know taking it seriously and that is something that i want to tell to all the students who are sitting here believe in yourself okay your guide can be wrong and many a times possibly it is true that he is wrong he or she and it is important to believe in and if uh, these people have continued possibly we would have got a nobel prize which we have lost now okay so this is something that i think is a lesson for all of us to know that we should believe in to whatever extent uh, anybody comes against your beliefs it's that something which is a very very important thing in any scientific discoveries and then this whole concept of trying to see deep into the material is not something very new people long long back itself people were working on this uh, you know people came up with a small uh, microscope i do not know if anybody knows who was the first to bring a microscope this microscope that you are seeing in front of you was Uh, attributed to Galileo. All of us know Galileo is uh, more. We attribute him, him to a telescope. Okay, but here is uh, something which uh, I also came to know much later that uh, yes, he is the one who brought the first uh, kind of a compound microscope. With that, people started seeing small, small things. Now people are going to the extent to talk about 4D microscopy, not even a 2D microscopy anymore. Uh, trying to see how time plays a role. in in my uh, microstructural evolution and trying to look at for example nucleation and growth how nucleation happens how growth happens in front of your eyes you can see this with what are called in situ microscopy a lot of uh, uh, great microscopists are working on such in, in situ microscopy and we are all as metallurgists second year physical metallurgy we all would have seen this microstructure the so called perlite okay and again the issue with such a microscope when compared to what you have seen in the previous slide this is a much uh, more improvement but still the problem with that this microscope that you see has a limit of its resolution which is around 200 nanometers or so and now when everybody is so excited about nanomaterials people want to see the nanomaterials and how atoms are arranged in such a nanomaterial obviously this kind of a microscope will not suit so people wanted to go to uh, better microscopes and many a times such kind of a need to go to better microscopes came from various interesting discoveries this is one such discovery again many of you possibly are aware of that a discovery of uh, an aircraft or an invention of an aircraft by the right brothers you all know what is the the base behind the uh, uh, aircraft that the right brothers have used is an aluminum alloy okay the crank case uh, of that uh, uh, particular uh, aircraft was an aluminum alloy and again there was a great uh, uh, famous gentleman by name wilm in 1903 and around that years he was always trying to make a uh, uh, high uh, strength uh, light materials for example aluminum alloys so all of us know aluminum is very soft okay a typical pure aluminum has a, a yield strength of about 50 megapascal in comparison to a mild steel which has around 200 megapascal and everybody knew by that time that if i take a steel heat it to high temperature and quench it i get that steel uh, becomes very hard very strong so so he also thought maybe the same thing happens with aluminum so he took an aluminum alloy containing some copper and kept on doing this again and again and uh, every time he saw that the aluminum uh, alloy which was quenched from high temperature was always not strong and uh, and the story goes that uh, on a weekend he did the similar experiment on a friday left the sample and then went for sailing and comes back on monday and as a as a good researcher does who does not want to give up easily he took up that particular alloy again wanted to vary parameters about heat treatment and before that he wanted to check what is the hardness of the alloy and when he did the hardness test he suddenly found that this particular alloy has much higher hardness than what it was on a friday and so that means something has happened an angel has come possibly and changed the whole hardness of the alloy during those two days saturday and sunday 
and he immediately got excited about it and repeated it a number of times immediately a company called dural uh, has patented this and they started calling it as duraluminum which we all know now as a most famous uh, aerospace aluminum alloy and uh, and they attributed it to aging so they started calling it as age hardening okay we all know that by aging we actually become soft typically you all know that your grandparents are much softer than your parents okay whereas here is a case by aging something is becoming hard but the reason why it has become hard was not known to people and much later almost 30 years after that around 1935 or 40 Uh, they took the same alloy put it into a new microscope that was developed by another great gentleman by name ernst raska okay in 1932 he comes up with a microscope called transmission electron microscope okay this is one of the uh, 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 highest resolution microscopes that is known those days uh, and of course much more developments have taken place the first tem that was developed by him gave a, a magnification of about 50x okay that is the level with which it started and now people talk about resolutions as high as as good as you know 0.7 angstroms and with that kind of a microscope around 1940 when somebody put this alloy into the microscope they saw a wonderful uh, very fine features inside the microscope which people started calling them as precipitates and that's how this particular thing is now called as precipitation hardening for a metallurgist any industry fellow may call it as a age hardening but a metallurgist knows why that hardening has taken place and that is the reason why we use the term precipitation hardening and such fine precipitate cannot be seen by the so called optical microscope and because they have a thickness of the order of around 20 nanometers or so and that is where uh, microscopes such as uh, transmission electron microscope uh, really became a great uh, discoveries which can demonstrate how the materials are at small scale now the whole question of can i make these finer can i do some more alloy design to make the precipitates finer and finer change the shape of them can i do uh, various uh, you know games that i can play with the alloy so that i can make the alloy better not only simply stronger stronger and tougher can i do all these combinations lot of physical metallurgy has gone into all that all that was thanks to the the capacity of metallurgists to be able to see such small scale and and that led to a variety of microscopes to an extent that now we have something called titan with us Uh, in india at least there are four or five titans uh, and the first one possibly came to ta for bombay and this is the titan that i am talking about at iit madras which can show you uh, uh, give you a resolution of 0.7 angstroms less than an angstrom what you see on the right bottom uh, are what are called silicon dumbbells uh, the white dots that you see are all atoms of silicon seen inside the microstructure inside a microscope of this nature and this is become very popular and these are called aberration corrected microscopes earlier years when people uh, were working on uh, tem they always knew that uh, the high resolution of a tem is coming because of uh, uh, what is called uh, small lambda and they knew that the lambda and the voltage have an inverse relation so if i want a smaller and smaller lambda so that i can get a better and better resolution people thought the best way is to increase the voltage of the microscope so from a typical 100 kilovolt microscope you have even microscopes which are called 3000 kilovolt microscopes i have seen one such microscope in japan where people used to call it as overnight express because that microscope was, uh, was used only in the midnight okay the reason is there is a railway track going very close to that particular university that during the day time they realize that whenever the train goes the resolution is affected okay so as a result they used to wait for a calm time where the trains are not running between let's say 10 o'clock in the night to early morning let's say 5 o'clock in the morning that was the time people used to actually use that microscope so that is a, a level of uh, you know sophistication needed uh, to use such microscope but later people realized that uh, in spite of uh, uh, such a high voltage Uh, and a very small wavelength even a 100 kv microscope gives you 0.04 angstrom wavelength 
Though it gives you 0.04 angstrom wavelength, the, the, the resolution that a 100 kV microscope typically gives you is of the order of around 5 nanometers or so. Okay, 2 to 5 nanometers, I can say. Okay, which is much uh, larger than the wavelength of the, uh, 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 the electron beam. So the people started thinking, what is going wrong? Why, in spite of me having such a small wavelength, my resolution is not equivalent to the wavelength. In principle, you should expect the resolution as close to the wavelength as possible. Then people realize all the problem is coming because of various aberrations that are there in my, uh, microscopes. Typically chromatic aberration, like spherical aberration, stigmatism. So, so many aberrations that are there in most of these microscopes. And then people started realizing the best way to get a better resolution is not to simply increase the voltage of a microscope and get a small uh, lambda because increasing such a voltage, please remember, uh, our typical voltage that comes to your home is 220 volts. From 220 volts, if you are to increase the voltage to 3000 kilo volts, can you imagine uh, how much of a step up transformer that you need? And so people realized, let me solve the problem in a different way. So they started coming up with what are called aberration corrections. So can we correct aberrations? In a normal optical lenses, people have been able to correct aberrations very easily. Okay, and similar things have happened. And as a result, these microscopes now, the Titan that you are seeing in front of us are typically called aberration corrected microscopes. And because of which, even with a typical 300 kV microscope, you can get a 0.7 angstroms. Of course, they are very expensive. Okay, this particular microscope, which is in front of you, costed us about approximately about 20 crores. Uh, to set up this particular microscope and and a normal TEM would cost you about five crores. So it's almost four times costlier than a normal TEM. And with such kind of microscopes, people are able to get wonderful, uh, you know, images of atoms, for example, inside a material. And what you see uh, very nicely here, these spotty patterns, where if you carefully look at it, there is a five-fold symmetry here. Okay, pentagons you will see everywhere. So this is basically a quasi-crystalline material. It's an aluminum copper, uh, you know, uh, iron alloy, which shows this kind of a high resolution image where each dot, white dot that you are seeing is an image of an atom and people are able to get that kind of a fascinating uh, arrangement of atoms. And people also start uh, develop a variety of other microscopes. TEM is not the only microscope that can give you uh, atomic resolution imaging. There are other microscopes. People were always excited to find out, can I see things at a small scale? This is one such microscope, which is called atomic force microscope, where if you put your hand under the microscope, you can start seeing, uh, I mean, this is the hand that I'm showing you here. And at a, a higher uh, magnification, you will be able to see the blood cells. And you can also see the helical nature of the DNA and the molecules in the DNA. All this can be seen easily in an atomic force microscope. And, and people have started getting excited about such small things and started making materials uh, out of such small things and also started making products out of such small particles, uh, which are now called nano products. Okay, a variety of products starting from cosmetics that many of you possibly use to a variety of electronics uh, applications or uh, name anything you have healthcare, everywhere you have these nanomaterials entering into our lives. For example, I do not know if you have used a Colgate whitening toothpaste today morning or a Pepsodent whitening toothpaste, you already used nanoparticles. Okay, so there are nanoparticles everywhere around us in most, most, uh, quite a number of various uh, products that we use nowadays. And all this is still not uh, very new. A lot of people seem to have known this long, long back. Uh, for example, what you see, these colorful images in window panes, uh, these are all glass uh, panels in windows in old churches, and all these colors are coming because of what are called nano emulsions. Okay, People knew that if I take gold, for example, the glittering yellow color of gold comes only when the grain size is more than 100 nanometers. The moment you make the grain size 50 nanometers, it becomes greenish in color. If you make it around 25 nanometers, it becomes reddish in color. And if you can make a gold nanoparticles of 10 nanometers or so, the gold can be black in color. 
Okay, so you can completely change the color of uh, a material. This is, for example, that you see in front of you. It is simply all these colors are coming because of uh, particles of silica, SiO2, suspended in water. Okay, only difference is the size of the particles are different. So depending on the size of the particles, you can get different, different colors coming out of it. These are all now very well known to people, not only simply optical properties, magnetic properties, mechanical properties, many of these properties can be tuned by making the uh, size smaller and we call it as you know uh, what is called size dependent properties nowadays uh, and a lot of people are excited. Even olden days it seems uh, uh, you know this has been well known whether it is happened you know uh, in, uh, incidentally or accidentally we do not know but uh, you know this is one such example I can tell you of course India we are all proud of uh, being metallurgists, I can say that uh, this particular iron pillar that you see in Delhi, the so-called rustless wonder, almost 1500 years back, it was standing in open air for 1500 years without getting rusted. This is the beauty of metallurgy and the metallurgical heritage of India. Steel, I mean, when I was studying BTEC, I do not know if you know this or not. When I was studying BTEC, I always knew People told me, people who taught me metallurgy told me that steel was first made by Bessemer. Okay. But before the great grandfathers of Bessemer was, were born, 2000 years before Bessemer, uh, we had steel made in India. Okay. In the borders of Andhra and Karnataka particularly, they have been very popular, uh, uh, you know, uh, making the steel. And they used to call it as ukku. I think in Tamil, people use the word ekku. Uh, for steel and this is iron or something like that. So this is such a thing and people were started calling it as woods because ukku possibly they could not pronounce it. This was called woods and the most fascinating thing was that particular steel was so strong that it can cut a helmet into two pieces. So people made swords out of it. Again more importantly you know not only the material was so great I can say that the manufacturing process that people knew uh, those days was fascinating. You can see any sword is like a sheet of metal. And if you take a piece of the sword and do a com chemical composition analysis, you will find out that the carbon content is almost 1.2 to 1.4 percent carbon. And all of us metallurgists know 1.4 percent carbon steel is brittle. But if you want to make a brittle material into a sword and if you start hammering it, it will break into pieces. So people knew the whole technology of the so-called thermomechanical processing of how to convert such a, a high carbon steel into the form of a, a sheet of metal without casting it. Please understand, these are all not cast. They are something like a forged materials, okay, or you know, hammered materials. I don't know how the technology was. We are talking of 2000 years old technology. Uh, fascinating metallurgists that we had. I mean, whenever I keep thinking about this, uh, my, my, you know, joy of being a metallurgist grows uh, manifold. And, and now people started making such materials in a small scale without much difficulty. This is one such a, a, a work that we did with the CVRD, Audi, where they said, sir, we have, whenever we want to make armor plates for, you know, all these, uh, um, uh, battle tankers uh, and we see that when we use a steel typically the welded joint is uh, very brittle you fire a bullet it pierces through the welded joint they said can we do something and that is when we took up this and basically through thermomechanical processing we converted the microstructure of the steel into extremely small scale this is like a nano structured steel if we can say or call it as nano steel quite a number of people for example badesia calls it as nano steel and and one can easily do this nowadays and with that if you look at the stress strain diagram the area under the stress strain diagram tells you how tough the material is and with that if you can now make the steel and then weld the steel not only the base metal but also the welded joint you fire a bullet nothing happens to it okay so this is the way one can demonstrate how a nanotechnology can be uh, used in a real life uh, examples and a lot of people are have taken up this uh, into a big way and quite a number of uh, uh, examples i can show you like that this is one such example where again we uh, worked with uh, a, a, a drdo lab called ARDE in pune 
okay where they use piezoelectric materials for what is called structural health monitoring of uh, submarines for example okay and piezoelectric material which is uh, pzt uh, uh, lead zirconium titanate for example uh, all of us are aware of this material uh, the dielectric constant of this material is the most crucial thing and and a normal piezoelectric material gives you a dielectric constant of about 2000 whereas when we make it nano like this each of this particle is extremely small you can see the scale here around 10 nanometer kind of particle sizes we are talking at that level 10 to 30 nanometers or so you get extremely high dielectric constant with that the sensitivity of the piezoelectric material increases to such an extent that when you use it for and non destructive testing for example all of you know ultrasonic uh, testing where these piezoelectric materials are used you will be able to uh, see much smaller defects much more easily uh, as a result uh, an early warning can be easily given so that is how we have been able to demonstrate that you can increase the sensitivity of a uh, ultrasonic tester by almost 50 times by using such a nano crystal material not only that it also has a, a, a special property of what is called energy harvesting for example you know a piezoelectric material when you compress it you can generate electricity so if you can make this into the form of a something like a small pellet like a 1 rupee coin and put it into your shoe and as you keep on walking you can generate electricity this is another uh, important application that the drdo is using these materials for and one can deposit it in fact if you can make it into the form of a mat and put it at the entrance of a big shopping mall you can possibly as people walk over that you will be able to generate electricity and possibly you know use it for uh, you know lightening the uh, shopping mall so like that a lot of great things can be done all this is possible because we are able to see materials at small scale and be able to uh, design material is because of such kind of a knowledge that you gain by seeing that small scale now i enter into the real uh, uh, topic of today where people wanted to uh, they were not happy with whatever they have seen they said all that you are the tm shows so far is only a 2d image can i see it in 3d uh, atomic arrangements in materials and that's how the whole concept of field and microscopy started people wanted to see how atoms are arranged on various surfaces okay this is again we are happy that there is an indian associated with this uh, kanwar bahadur uh, from npl who was working with professor muller in penn state and he was uh, uh, developing what is called field and microscope and a field and microscope gives you images like this where each white dot that you see here is nothing but an atom on the surface of something this is a platinum you can do it with every material the reason uh, why uh, people were interested is for example if you are talking of catalysis catalysis the catalytic property of a material or the efficiency of catalysis depends on how atoms are arranged on a particular surface certain surfaces are more catalytically active but sur certain surfaces are not so can i find out what is the correlation between catalytic activity and arrangement of atoms on a particular surface so people were trying to use this but the problem is when professor muller was working on this microscope Uh, whenever they tried they were not able to set get such a clear wonderful image of atoms if you carefully look at it you will see the four fold symmetry which is very clear because platinum being a cubic material you will see that four fold symmetry so one thing that uh, you know professor uh, dr kanwar bahadur felt was possibly we are doing all this they put the sample inside they are trying to use the field and microscope to be able to see the atoms but the atoms are not able to show very sharp images he thought the reason could be because the atoms are vibrating he thought let me uh, uh, somehow dampen their vibration by cooling the sample he suddenly puts a liquid helium into the uh, sample holder without the knowledge of professor muller that's how a good student should do uh, and uh, because Uh, many a times if you tell to your guide he, uh, he may not allow you to do certain things so he put it and immediately he saw in front of him a wonderful image of uh, uh, the atoms and immediately he calls his professor and the professor was so excited to see this kind of an image that came out so with that the whole concept of field and microscopy started
the person who is standing here uh, on uh, the right side is my own professor professor ranganathan uh, who during his uh, phd days was working on uh, field ion microscopy i am so fortunate that somehow my life also um, brought me into this field without my knowledge uh, when i joined for phd with him i mean it was uh, i always tell to people it was like a, a love at first, first sight the first lecture i heard of him i thought if i do my phd i should do only with him i had a, a phd offer from cambridge i just threw it uh, and stayed back at iisc bangalore and worked with this great gentleman by name professor ranganathan and and now people started talking about even the previous image that i showed you of a field and microscope is still on a surface only can we see them uh, uh, in a 3d so that brought people to what is called tomography now tomography is well known okay people talk about ct scans okay in uh, in um, you know medical uh, imaging and uh, can we do a similar ct scan at the atomic level the only problem with normal ct scans is that the resolutions uh, is uh, very poor almost like a, a millimeter of resolution or a, a at least 100 microns resolution or so uh, the typical tomography that we know and can i get a resolution of the order of an atomic size and that is how people started working from the field ion microscope towards what we now call it as a local electrode atom probe in 2002 tom kelly comes up with this particular technique called local electrode atom probe and with that now we have these microscopes okay which is one that we established at iit uh, madras in 2017 where if you see the right side uh, what you see is something uh, rotating there which is a tip of a uh, metallic sample where every dot that you see is an atom i can see what kind of atoms of course these colors are all fictitious colors that we give so one color to one atom so that i know which atom is sitting where whether a particular atom is sitting at the grain boundary or sitting inside the grain all this can be easily found out by this kind of a um, uh, you know technique and how does this work Uh, it works once first and foremost is you need to have a, a tip of a sample you have to make a, a metallic sample in the form of a sharp tip once you have that you put a pulsed voltage or a laser beam on uh, at the tip and an atom is released out of it by by a certain field that is generated and once the atom is pulled out uh, with the help of certain field there there is a local electrode there through which this particular atom goes and gets reflected by a reflector and then hits a, a detector the moment it hits a detector the time that atom has taken from the tip of the sample to the detector is is a measure of the mass of the particular atom so the heavier the atom the slower it wa uh, walks okay so with that we know what that particular atom is and the position where it is hitting is an indicative of where the particular atom is in in that particular uh, uh, sample so this way the xy coordinates of uh, uh, the atom hitting on the detector are indicative of the xy coordinates uh, uh, of the atom in the particular sample and by taking out one layer of atom and then you take the second layer so you start getting the z the the depth of the position where the atom was coming from and with that you can uh, get layer by layer this information stitch all the layers inside the uh, uh, you know computer and recreate the whole sample in an image like this so this is a recreated image from a sample like this and you will be able to see a 3d image of the whole sample and of course it takes some time okay i can tell you when i was doing this in 99 to 2001 for two years i worked on this atom probe possibly i was the first uh, you know indian from india to have worked on atom probe and after the me lot of people have worked on this and after coming back to india uh, in 2001 that was a dream for me to have such a microscope uh, in the country but at those days the microscope Uh, i am talking about even before tom kelly came with the local electrode uh, atom probe that leap so before that the atom probes were of a much i would say uh, not so efficient versions as a result if i put the sample inside uh, the atom probe wait for about 24 hours i will be able to collect around 50000 atoms or so but now you put a atom uh, a sample inside the atom probe leap 
and within one hour you will be able to collect at least about uh, 20 million atoms okay that's a minimum almost in about 15 minutes you can get collect almost 5 million atoms that is the uh, fastness with which an atom probe works and and all that is thanks to the the whole uh, technology of the electronics just for your information atom probe costed us uh, almost about uh, uh, 30 crores and the rest of the uh, sample operation techniques uh, which is called a fib uh, costed us about 7 8 uh, crores and the whole total total uh, nfapt we call it as national facility for atom probe tomography was about 40 crores and and so so it is expensive i do agree but you can see fascinating things uh, inside the mat material and be able to design materials with the help of such a thing and there are so many ways by which you can prepare the sharp tip the bottle neck is to have a sharp tip Uh, uh, to put inside the atom probe and the sharp tip people earlier when i was doing 99 to 2001 there was nothing called fib uh, in the world so we were doing it by what is called electro polishing and then now what you have is something called focused ion beam which is basically a, a kind of an attachment inside a, a scanning electron microscope so we call it as a dual beam microscope and uh, and this dual beam microscope basically has one beam which is an electron beam to see the sample and you have a second beam called ion beam to cut the sample this is like a, a, a milling machine if i can say so uh, or a drilling machine whatever you want to call it as at a very very small scale for example if i have a sheet of metal like that i can identify a small region which i want to cut out of this i can use the uh, uh, you know ion beam to uh, create a trench on both sides and then cut one side and bring what is called uh, an omni probe uh, near to that region and weld that omni probe here is the omni probe you are bringing it near to that particular cut sample and then you weld it here all this is happening inside the scm please understand okay this welding how do i do i deposit platinum at the junction between the two that is something like i do not call it as welding let's say i call it as brazing whatever you want to call it as we do all that and once uh, you come to know that this uh, joint is very strong strong enough then you cut this side once you cut this side you can lift the whole uh, thing it is like a cantilever beam now you bring that cantilever beam and put it on top of a pillar what are called micro pillars and cut the particular piece Uh, from this particular region so that you have something like a, a cube so it is put and cut now so you have something like a cube of material and this cube of material if you start further sharpening you get a tip of material now and this tip is of the order of around 20 30 nanometers it has to be at least less than about 100 nanometers to be able to collect, get a good field and be able to collect atoms from that and and that can give you a lot of interesting things my uh, you know life with atom probe has started with this particular alloy when i went to japan to work with a gentleman by name hono okay very famous gentleman in the field of atom probe tomography and we were having uh, an idea of how to uh, you know um, utilize this atom probe uh, for understanding interesting phenomena in materials so one such phenomenon was uh, 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 in metallic glasses such as a zirconium based alloy uh, people realized that depending on who is making the metallic glass for the same composition somebody when he heats this metallic glass he used to see that there are certain crystals coming out of it when somebody else was making the metallic glass and heating it he started seeing that there are some quasi crystals coming out of the metallic glass the composition of the alloy was exactly the same so there were two groups one in germany one in japan two groups were reporting two different results as a result of heating that particular glass so i thought it has something to do with oxygen because zirconium uh, has a great affinity to oxygen so i thought while making the alloy if one is not careful and a lot of oxygen goes into the material then possibly it can change the whole kinetics of crystallization of the glass so what we did was i we made three alloys with different amounts of oxygen inside and when you do an x-ray diffraction all of them show that it is glass 
But the moment you put these three into a DSC, differential scanning calorimeter, and heat it, you will see one of them gives you only one single peak. The other one gives you two peaks. The higher the oxygen content, you start getting a two peaks. And when you want to know why these two peaks are, the one with a lower oxygen, when you put and heat the sample inside a DSC uh, as a function of uh, time, at a particular temperature, this is at 400 degrees centigrade, you see an amorphous alloy becomes a crystalline and you get crystals of ZR2CUAL. Whereas if you take a high oxygen containing alloy, the alloy first becomes a quasi-crystal, uh, the peaks correspond to quasi-crystal. You may ask me, how do you know, sir? I am going to tell you within a minute how uh, I come to know. And then, then when you heat it further for a longer period, you get crystals. So the final stage is the same in both the cases accepting that there is an intermediate stage where you start getting a quasi crystal in a high oxygen containing alloy and if you do a tem you will know much more easily a normal uh, alloy with low oxygen content gives you crystal and you do a diffraction you easily see the periodic arrangement of uh, you know diffraction spots in a tem whereas if you take a high oxygen containing alloy and you do a, a diffraction from each of these uh, particles the precipitates that you are getting in the alloy and they give you a five-fold diffraction pattern. The quasi-crystals are found here. There is no quasi-crystal here. There is a quasi-crystal here. So that tells you that there is something oxygen is doing. Oxygen is possibly going into the glass and possibly making some clusters inside which are crystallizing as a quasi-crystal. Possibly oxygen is stabilizing the quasi-crystal. So this is the concept that we proposed and we wanted to know how to prove that oxygen is inside the quasi crystals. We tried to do a EDS mapping. It was not able to show, but when we went to the atom probe, we were able to see that there are small regions in an atom probe with whatever little atom probe that we are able to do those days. I'm talking of 20 years back uh, when the atom probe is being done. Okay, We could find that there is a small particle here. Inside the particle, there is a lot of oxygen inside. Of course, you may say uh, it does not seem to be very lot, but after a lot of study, we find that all the oxygen that we are putting inside the material is going and sitting in those particles. With that, we were able to prove that oxygen stabilizes quasi crystals. That was a big, uh, uh, I would say, a revolutionary discovery on those days. And a lot of people got excited about it, and a lot of work has happened after that. Now, this particular technique can be used for very, very uh, any application wherever you want to understand materials. This is one such material called ODS steel, oxide dispersion strength and steel, where people wanted to develop okay uh, materials for fast breeder reactors. Okay, for in a nuclear reactor you have what is called nuclear fuel pin, which is nothing but a tube of uh, steel where you put a nuclear fuel and a fission reaction takes place inside. But in a normal reactor. Uh, they use mostly 9 chrome 1 moly steel, but this 9 chrome 1 moly steel will not work beyond 500 degrees centigrade. The moment the temperature inside goes beyond 500 degrees centigrade, this material starts creeping. Whereas in a fast breeder reactor, the temperature goes to 700 degrees centigrade. So how do we solve? So people started thinking if I put oxide particles into the steel, then I can improve the creep resistance of the steel. So we have started making these steels using what is called powder metallurgy root, where you make powders of steel and incorporate the yttria nanoparticles into them and make a consolidated material and study the properties. And you see these ODS steels have much higher strength, even at 700 degrees centigrade when compared to conventional steels. And all these people have been able to now uh, utilize it to make materials. For example, people have used um, uh, Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, which is close to uh, Chennai, where they were able to collaborate with the RCI, where they made this particular material in large quantities and used DMRL to hip this material uh, by hipping technique. And then NFC, what is called nuclear fuel complex, was able to make them in the form of cubes. This is a four meter long cube with about six millimeter diameter. And that's all made by this kind of a material. And that now this material is being tested for whether it is a good material. And already there are a lot of good indications that it has excellent creep resistance and possibly this is one of the very good materials for such application. Not only nuclear, but also for uh, what are called supercritical boilers in, in uh, thermal power plants. People, BHEL is very much excited about this kind of materials. And to know 
where are these nanoparticles of yttria is that yttria particle that i am putting is it remaining as yttria or something else is happening some reaction is happening if you want to know if you take the material into a tem you will simply see that there is a particle nothing beyond that okay and you want to do uh, uh, mapping of uh, or find out what elements are present what is the composition of this it's not so easy to do at uh, this with the titan to some extent you can do but if you want to see it in 3d okay you can see atom probe is the best method where you can see that there is this is a steel piece inside which there are particles this is a small particle 2 nanometer or 3 nanometers in size and inside which what atoms are present i can easily find out and i can put a line across this and can find out what is the composition of it i can do a composition analysis at the 2 nanometer level all this is possible now and with that we were able to after 15 years of my struggle to set up such a facility i went to almost everybody uh, requesting for some funding to get this i went to dst dst said uh, who can give you 40 crores it's very difficult then i asked that co company there is only one company which makes this leap i asked can you make this uh, leap remotely operable he said give me about 6 months professor i'll come back to you so after 6 months that gentleman comes uh, and from our seminar hall in iit madras he was able to connect to his sample which was in madison in usa hmm, where inside an atom probe in madison they put the sample there he was able to connect from his laptop and was able to uh, 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 kind of align the sample using the software and be able to collect atoms from that particular sample all this in 15 minutes he was able to demonstrate our iit madras director was sitting in that erci director professor sundararajan dr sundararajan was sitting there so after that i uh, was able to convince everybody yes a remotely operable atom probe is possible and then i went to almost seven uh, almost every iit those days whatever number of iits that were there 23 iits i went to each iit director finally six uh, iits okay the five older iits plus iit roper these are the six iits which gave me 2 2 crores each and erci hyderabad gave me 2 crores each with that 14 crores i went to dst i said i have 14 crores now you give me 25 more crores and dst gave me 25 more crores and that is what you see now and what is called nfapt set up here it runs on a 24 by 7 we have three uh, operators who run in three shifts this particular microscope this is the only facility i can uh, proudly say in the whole country possibly which runs on a 24 by 7 and a facility where somebody simply sends a, a sample to us we polish the sample using a fib which is here and if necessary we put it inside a tem to check it if needed otherwise put it into an atom probe which is here and the moment we put it into the atom probe all these partners have a, a workstation like this on their computer on their desktop and they use that workstation to get connected to this particular atom probe and operate the atom probe sitting from iit delhi iit bombay kharagpur kanpur roper you name it okay this is first of its kind i am Uh, delighted to see that we have been able to bring i mean my whole uh, objective as as a, uh, as a uh, researcher in the country is that whenever i used to see quite a number of students you know thinking that everything is green on the other side and the moment you finish btech think of a, a phd somewhere abroad i used to always think that can we not have the best of the facilities in our backyard in the country and try to demonstrate to people that everything that you have over there is also here okay the only thing that we need to create is an environment where the bright ideas are supported and and nurtured and that is something where all of us the culture has to change the research culture has to change but if we can bring facilities i can tell you uh, you know there are so many uh, so called top notch institutions in the world which do not have an atom probe of this nature okay so that is the beauty now not only iit madras iisc bangalore has it and slowly possibly some more places possibly will have maybe one day iit hyderabad will have let's see how things go so it is possible to do that and lot of things can be done with such a microscopes facility and this is one such case so if i take a sample like this and do a mapping elemental mapping the way we do it in a cm eds okay you can see every atom okay 
inside the material iron tungsten chromium they are all more or less uniformly distributed yttrium titanium oxygen you see they are uh, segregated into these small small particles okay and to tell you that these are yttrium titanium oxygen clusters okay why to ti2o7 we were able to even find out what is the exact composition what is the stoichiometry of such a thing at a 2 nanometer scale please understand okay this is a beauty and no other microscope can possibly do of that nature and one can do variety of things this is another such example of uh, uh, many such particles which can be seen and this is a high entropy alloy we wanted to demonstrate that high entropy alloys can have wonderful uniformity inside their uh, atomic composition in the alloy this is a five component alloy if you put it in an atom probe you can show that all of them exact very very uniformly distributed including carbon nitrogen oxygen people can even see hydrogen inside this particular alloys nowadays okay that is the beauty of such a uh, material but it depends on how you make that such a high entropy alloy if you use certain casting techniques you have a tendency of uh, what is called segregation dendrites and interdentic regions so there is a possibility of atoms segregating again an atom probe can show you very easily where each atom each particular element is getting segregated copper and iron completely get uh, dissociate with uh, each other because there is a positive delta h mixing between those two so all our thermodynamics can be easily tested from these things at a small scale and design different alloys which can have a good mutual solubility and we wanted to also know whether there is a mm, you know grain boundary segregation in this particular alloy because we were working on diffusion in these particular alloys we wanted to know whether uh, atoms diffuse uh, faster at a grain boundary when compared to uh, the grain in a high entropy alloy okay which has five components or four components so to prove that we wanted to first know whether there is any segregation of any element at the grain boundary so luckily uh, fib focused ion beam can be used to find out uh, to cut a sample exactly at a location where there is a grain boundary is existing inside a material and ensure that the grain boundary goes uh, uh, longitudinally across the material and once you make such a material put it into an atom probe and do an atom probe and you can clearly see that this material is completely homogeneous there is there is a grain boundary at the center here but you will not see any atomic uh, uh, distribution of any particular element segregated at the grain boundary so to prove that such high entropy alloys are atomically homogeneous even at the grain boundaries and one can demonstrate this in variety of alloys and demonstrate you can uh, once you have uh, the whole at elemental distribution you can choose a small domain that you want okay a small region and in the in that region you can get a line scan you can get a composition analysis you can do lot of things inside this the way you do it in eds and you can also see materials which have let's say two phase microstructures this is a two phase alloy with each phase is like a eutectic uh, alloy with a two uh, lamella kind of thing where each of them is about 10 nanometers or so and such a thing can be easily seen and you can see which elements are segregated within the 10 to 20 nanometers you can find out what is the composition what elements are segregated so you can do a complete elemental mapping uh, and find out which element is depleted in one phase which element is enriched in some other phase and how much of enrichment is there how much of depletion is there can be found out and this can be done in a variety of materials i do not want to bore you with lot of materials but it can be done even carbon okay for example all of us know carbon uh, between austenite and uh, ferrite carbon gets dissolved more into austenite and less into ferrite all this you study in uh, in uh, physical metallurgy but can you see it it is not easy to see all this because carbon is such a small element in a eds you cannot find carbon very easily but in an atom probe you can clearly see this is a two phase material where all elements seem to be very homogeneously distributed iron chromium everything but suddenly you see carbon in this region carbon is highly the right to bottom region you have a carbon se segregation whereas on the left region there is no carbon much so that is a ferrite this is an austenite very clearly you can see that okay so all this can be easily said and i can choose a small line and do a line scan here and demonstrate that there is a carbon enrichment and uh, whereas all other elements are more or less uniformly distributed all this can be easily done hmm? 
and one can do this in variety of materials this is an oxide again in the oxides also one can find out where you have what atoms are sitting where and this is another okay uh, indium arsenic arsenide for example people call it as uh, you know uh, you know uh, opto electronic materials for example you can do that you can do uh, a shape memory alloy you can do nickel based super alloys gamma gamma prime variety of things one can do and to demonstrate that one can see uh, great things we can also uh, uh, see whether you have certain elements segregated really at the grain boundary in some cases for example this is an example where the grain boundary is enriched with sodium and potassium in a particular alloy and again this can clearly show that the sodium on the inside the grains is very little whereas it is segregated at the grain boundary all this for example many of you possibly know if you read about uh, super alloys okay long back people wanted to make single crystals of uh, you know ni3al hmm, and which is gamma prime and people found that with that we can get possibly wonderful uh, you know uh, material for uh, you know turbine blades or something like that but then they realized that it is very brittle but when they uh, know that when they put almost uh, about 30 ppm of boron the whole alloy becomes very tough they did not know where is this boron going and improving the toughness it is here uh, a technique such as an atom probe can clearly point out where is this boron going and sitting Uh, is it sitting at the grain boundaries and improving the cohesion at the grain boundaries which is what has been proposed by people without knowing what is happening and you can actually see this very easily and one can use uh, this technology for variety of studies start i divided this into two groups one i called it as structural materials uh, such as high strength steels precipitation segregation okay aluminum alloys magnesium alloys name any alloys wherever you want to study precipitation kinetics and what elements for example all of us know about when you are talking about dura aluminum or aluminum copper alloys when you talk about precipitation we talk about different stages okay what we call it as gp zones okay theta double prime theta prime and theta and when we talk about gp zones everybody says oh gp zones are aluminum rich or uh, copper rich precipitates okay copper rich zones they are not even called precipitates why because they are extremely small in nature to be even called as a precipitate okay and it is though people say they are copper rich nobody knew how much of copper is there inside those gp zones it is this particular technique atom probe can show you for example if you know aluminum silicon alloys okay if i add a small amount of strontium or sodium the silicon needles get get completely get converted into globular okay we call this as modification just 0.02% of strontium can do this nobody knows what is this strontium doing where is this fellow going and sitting to change a complete morphology of uh, this particular silicon into that we also know about in cast irons you can convert a graphite flakes into uh, nodules okay and we know that certain elements can do this and those elements that are added are extremely small in quantity and now atom probe can show you where those elements are sitting and possibly the the theory is that for example in aluminum silicon alloys the theory is that that strontium goes uh, on to the silicon particle the moment it nucleates and does not allow the silicon particle to grow along a particular direction to make it into the form of a plate or a needle and this can be seen using atom probe and we have been able to do that and this kind of things can be easily done and coming into functional materials you can look at battery materials hard ma magnetic or soft magnetic material ferroelectric materials uh, uh, nanotubes for example what element is filled into the nanotube you can see catalysis hydrogen adsorption in a hydrogen storage material uh, coarser nanoparticles and uh, you name it everywhere nano wires and variety of materials so all of these uh, can be easily seen using this so very very exciting world i think i gave you a glimpse of what that excitement is and any of you uh, as you go into your research you can utilize this facility that is available and be able to you just have to put a small proposal and tell people why do you want to use it if you go to uh, google and put nfapt you will go to a particular website where a particular form is given there if you download that form and fill up that form and simply say that i want to use atom pro because i think the problem that i am solving cannot be solved by acm or tem i feel only atom pro can solve immediately people will look at that 
and will be able to take up your sample and help you. Only thing is because it is an expensive tool, we do not want everybody to put every sample into it. There has to be a certain problem that you are trying to solve, which needs atom probe, and then we are willing to take up any such study and help people. And this is a facility open for the whole country, and anybody in the country can use it. And in fact, people from outside the country are also coming and using it. And that's the beauty of this facility. And thank you very much. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'm through. If there are any questions, if there is a moderator uh, who can see the questions in the chat box and give it to me, uh, I'm willing to take up. Sir, there isn't any queries in the chat box. Good, very good. It was crystal clear, uh, sir, actually. Thank you very much. I, I do not know. I do not know. <laughs> I, we always say that when there is no question from a student, either student has understood everything or did not understand anything. Both are possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you very much. And nice. uh, if there are any any closing remarks, if you have, otherwise we can close the session. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful and informative session. And we are sure that. Each of us has a lot to take back today. We once again express our heartfelt gratitude for having taken out time from your busy schedule to address us. It was really amazing, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm always there. I mean, any teacher uh, uh, loves the time that he spends with a student. So, so when students ask me anything, if your teacher has asked you, I would have thought twice. But because it was your student, your colleague who approached me directly, so I could not say no to her. Hmm? So, so say thanks to Uma, whoever has approached me. That was the reason why I'm here today. Sure. Thank you very sir, much. Sir, I really feel uh, glad that you uh, accepted my request. <laughs> and it was really thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Bye bye to all of you. OK. Thank you, sir. Thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, for your kind cooperation throughout the event. So we're confident each of us must have thoroughly enjoyed and learned a lot from this edifying session. So stay tuned for the upcoming guest lectures in the autumn series. Till then, bidding you goodbye. Stay home, stay safe.